Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Lauren. I'm the member resources rep here at Subta and also your event planner for the upcoming Sub Summit. Um, on behalf of the entire Subta team, I want to wish everyone that's joining us today a happy new year. Um, hopefully you guys had a safe and healthy end to the year and are ready for a successful 2022. Um, again, on the behalf of the entire SEPTA team, we're extremely proud to partner with Digital Remedy and Blue Apron for today's webinar. Um, we have Ben Brenner today and TJ Sullivan from Digital Remedy, who will also be joined by uh, Blue Apron's VP of Growth, Car Parmisivam, to discuss the advantages of serving ads on OTT platforms, growing your brand awareness, and measuring the true impact of your marketing efforts to achieve a successful 2022. Um, I want to do just a quick introduction of our three hosts today, and then I'll pass the mic over to Digital Remedy to get started. Um, thanks, guys, so much for joining us. So first today, we have Ben Brenner, um, the VP of Business Development and Strategy at Digital Remedy. He has a background in performance marketing and ad tech startups, and he currently leads the Flip team focused on helping brands grow their impact on OTT and CTV space. Uh, TJ Sullivan is the EVP of sales at Digital Remedy. He comes to us with over 20 years of media sales and leadership experience and his knowledge of the digital media landscape, ability to develop strategic solutions that solve brand challenges and talent, talent for managing sales teams have made him a vital member of several media and ad tech organizations. So welcome to TJ and Ben. And last but not least, we have Car Parmisivan with us. He is the VP of growth at Blue Apron. Um, Carr has previously led successful growth teams in the on-demand delivery, co-working, and e-com sectors across various growth stages, ranging from Series A to exit events. He has a deep experience operating in digital channels, as well as significant experience deploying spend across traditional media channels. So thank you guys again so much for joining. Um, before we jump into today's presentation, just a couple housekeeping notes for those of you that have not joined a webinar before. Feel free to use your actual name in your Zoom profile. Uh, if you haven't done that already, you can click on the three dots next to your name um, and just let us know who's chatting in so we can really build our community. Um, and then to that point, we will be wrapping up today's webinar with a live Q&A segment. Um, so feel free to chat in questions as you have them throughout the presentation, um, and we'll address them near the end. Um, if you guys have questions, go ahead and put them actually into the Q&A section, and you can find that icon along the bottom center um, in the control panel of your Zoom profile. And then as always, today's webinar is going to be available um, next week on demand free for any premium sub to members. All right, guys, Ben, TJ, and Carr, I'm going to pass it over to you to get us started. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, the intros and, and for SUPTA for hosting us today, um, we're, we're excited to talk to everyone uh, regarding connected television. It's what we focus on as a company uh, and helping brands like Blue Apron. Um, our relationship with CAR goes back, uh, goes back a, a few different places. Um, and essentially, CAR has been focused in, in his most recent career uh, of growth. And, and that's why Blue Apron has, has brought him aboard. Um, we have worked with him when he was at Cup, as well as Nutrafol, uh, when he was in uh, similar roles in helping those brands to grow. Uh, so thank you, Carr, for, for your partnership and, and learning together on, on performance. So uh, really appreciate that and want to pass it to you if you have anything to add. All right. I really appreciate um, the invite to speak along you guys. Um, and Digital Remedy has been a great partner uh, for me uh, over the years. Uh, one of the most transparent organizations I've ever worked with. One of the few people who tell me sometimes I'm spending too much money and to dial it down. So when you tell me that, um, you know, uh, there's a a forge, um, a bond forge that, you know, really can't be broken in the growth world. So uh, really glad to, you know, um, be here with you guys and, and chat more about the future of uh, CTV. So. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much. So uh, for, for everyone on the call, thank you. Thank you for joining. And what we wanted to do today is talk a little bit about our learnings that we've had uh, with brands that Carr has worked with, and 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 he's going to share some of his insights uh, from a marketer's perspective, specifically around subscription and direct to consumer brands, uh, like like many of you. So we wanted to first, though, introduce 
what is OTT? Uh, it gets thrown around a lot. The growth, and I'm sure many of you have connected televisions uh, in, your, in your living room. There are 400 million connected televisions. Uh, if you are uh, anything like me and checking census data, that would make no sense because that means that there's more connected televisions than people. That means multiple, multiple uh, connected televisions in everyone's home. And essentially, if you're uh, old as me, you probably remember the rabbit ears back in the day. And when your mom was vacuuming, uh, your the squiggly lines would come across the screen. Then, of course, we moved on to cable hundreds of channels. Now, today, most people are switching over to connected televisions and consuming through streaming services. And, and that's where we want to focus our time today to talk to you about, uh, but also to talk about because the people are moving there uh, for the first time ever uh, in the last uh, five years, uh, television, linear television spending has gone down and it's moved over to connected television. So that's where we're, we're, we're focusing our time. As I mentioned, you know, this, this one, I'd like to stop here though and, and just ask a little bit about you know, Carl, what's your what's your take on on the connected TV space? How fast it's moving, and 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 how you look at it uh, in your media mix? Yeah, I think um, I had a I had a little bit of a personal moment uh, when I went back to India in December. My parents, I'm a late child. My parents are in their 80s, and uh, you know, I grew up on traditional linear TV. But this time over COVID, you know, as as they are looking for more content to consume, next next one thing I discovered is they're watching only connected TV, only OTT type channels and from Hulu to Hotstar and all the and various things that are available. That's when I started, um, you know, uh, it, you know, I've, I've always known it's a growing channel, but that's when it really hit me when my traditional parents uh, are now uh, just go, gone full digital uh, away from linear TV. So, you know, it's um, and I think one of the when, when I think companies in general think about TV in general, it's always been hesitate. There's a hesitation because of, of just the measurement aspect, but it kind of first started with addressable TV. You're set up box collecting a lot of data. Uh, but then now connected TV has completely changed the game because of uh, things like IP matching and, you know, matching up the pixels that I know we'll get into a little bit later, but I think it's starting to become a very critical uh, part of the marketing mix. Um, and, you know, as, as Folks ask me, you know, once they're kind of capped out in social and search, uh, where to go. Um, and if they're especially a visual brand and looking for a variety of consumers across demos and different ages, CTV is the first place I point them. So. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Ben jump in here um, and, and talk a little bit about all the, all the different ways that uh, we consume this uh, over the top. Uh, that's what OTT stands for, meaning it's over the top of your cable subscription, your wireless, um, and, your, and your streaming. And like I said, most of you probably are using streaming services, so you do understand that. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to start, though, by how are people actually doing that? And I'll, I'll pass over to Ben just as, uh, you know, he got the intro before, um, but, but Ben has been uh, a vital part in, in growing uh, our OTT solution and platform. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Ben. Cool. Um, I mean, the most common one is a smart TV, right? So um, when you think connected TV, you're probably thinking, you know, at the bat, uh, Vizios, LGs, Samsungs, the TVs that have a built-in operating system that allows you to connect to the internet. Um, that does represent a, a solid market share, um, but obviously there's other things involved. So um, you can think of dongles like uh, Fire Sticks or Roku Sticks or Chromecast. Um, there's plenty of streaming, honestly, that takes place on Smartphone, tablet, desktop. Um, plenty of people are watching, you know, Hulu in their bed at night. And if they don't have a TV in their room, the laptop's a great solution. Um, and then gaming consoles are involved as well. So um, it is important to just kind of get the um, the definition straight before you dive into the space. So OTT is not just CTV. They are two different things. CTV is an umbrella um, of OTT. Um, it's just those are the the full screen kind of screen on your wall connections or uh, screen on your wall impressions. Um, whereas OTT in general encompasses that kind of streaming full episode, long form um, across all different types of players, laptops, phones included. Um, in terms of publishers, um, you probably know some of the bigger ones. It is um, also pretty important to note that um, when we talk about OTT, not all of it is ad supported. So um, Netflix obviously comes to mind as the huge one. There's no ads um, within that Netflix player. so. 
Um, that is not necessarily what we're here to talk about today. We're more along the lines of something like a sling, um, whose logo you can see here. Um, and what we call sling is a VMVPD. Um, it's just a, a cable bundle that is put together and served digitally. Um, that programming is live. As you can see, there's there's a couple of different types of content to stream. Sling is a really great example, maybe the most well-known example of um, a digital cable bundle, uh, which is live programming. And then there's on-demand content. Um, and, you know, probably the best example of an ad-supported on-demand platform is Hulu, um, where you're just calling up content and watching, you know, Handmaid's Tale or whatever it might be on demand. Thanks, Ben. And, and uh, that you're, we're, we're going to we're gonna get your fill today, everyone, on, um, on acronyms. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to, to, to dig into them. But uh, thanks, Ben, for, for walking through that. And so that's the overview of OTT. But... We wanted to talk a little bit about, um, okay, that's an upper funnel tactic. That's something that is the video on your wall. And so if I'm looking for branding, that's a great, that's a great way to start as I, as I did with my television buys. Though we wanna take it in a bit of a different direction and tell you why it's so important for performance. Um, lower funnel KPIs like sales. Um, you know, one of the things that you know, we, we talk about is that diminished returns for search and social. Uh, what that means is that it, even though every one of you is probably using search and social, what you're going to start seeing is that 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 starts going down as far as attribution, um, and it, meaning the percentages. Um, and it's the old adage of half of it works. We just don't know which half. Um, and so this is about transparency in the marketplace when you're talking about connected television as well. Um, Car, can you share a little bit about your feelings with, with search, social, um, diminished returns, transparency in the marketplace? Sure. Um, we'll start with search. Um, you know, search has been, you know, fairly consistent over the last few years. Um, but one thing about search is you are only capturing demand that is <laughs> already existing for your product, uh, you know, and so sure, you can grow for a while on search, uh, make inroads, but, you know, depending on the industry you're in, uh, let's take lawyer print as an example, meal kits, highly competitive, new players, new nuances come in on a weekly basis, uh, on a monthly basis, someone selling like, you know, a particular niche on, on, on vegan, keto, and they're bidding on our work. So it just starts becoming incredibly, incredibly uh, not scalable uh, after a certain point uh, at the right return that we're looking for. Um, so there is that problem with search. And then if you start trying to go into um, adjacent, like meal kit, for example, if you start, you know, trying to bid on groceries and stuff like grocery key keywords and so on and so forth, you once again, you're just kind of going to hit that plateau. You, you might get a little bit of incremental value, but it's going to be incredibly expensive. And it's one of those things that just, um, you know, at, after a certain point, it just the math doesn't work out. Um, but definitely you can go deep and, and scale to a certain extent with search. Social, we all heard about iOS 14 last year. Uh, we, we in, in Facebook, in the Facebook platform, we built the, one of the, one of the greatest um, hunting dogs was, uh, was evolved in terms of acquiring customers, but then Apple just decided to chop off its nose. And so we completely, you know, big or small, a lot of people have lost the ability to track in the way that they're used to. Um, and, you know, uh, they're having difficulty kind of assessing, um, you know, the true impact uh, without building or, you know, doing incrementality analysis or like, um, you know, just finding, you know, putting a multi-touch attribution model in place and so on and so forth. So that's become a bit more cumbersome. I'm not saying that paid social does not work. I think paid social is the key point about paid social. If that's the way you expand your audience. Uh, once you hit that plateau in search, it's really about growing, bringing a new market, exposing them to your product and making a, a use case for them, for this new audience to, to you know, um, to, to make the purchase or convert. Um, so I, for me personally, paid social is one way to, to, to do it uh, across its various Facebook or Pinterest, so on and so forth. But there is TV and connected TV, uh, especially these days where you are potentially exposing your product to a 
whole new audience that perhaps, especially if you are in the market for, you know, a demo that perhaps is, you know, it's over 30, 35, like they're right there. Um, and, you know, I'm, you know, Ben mentioned it. I watch me and me and my girlfriend watch a lot of Handmaid's Tale. So like, and we've probably made a couple of uh, purchases off of OTT ads that we have been exposed to. So it's a huge market. It's, it's while a lot of brands are entering it, it's still, I think, fairly untapped. Uh, everyone still pours a tremendous amount of money into the paid social channels. But what I, when I first invested in CTV years ago, it was more as a supplement. Now I almost look at on par uh, as a performance marketing channel because of the data that's available and be, and from platforms such as Digital Remedy, especially Flip, which we'll get into later. So, awesome. yeah, uh, thank you for that. It's it's you touched on, upon a lot of things. We'll we'll dig in a little bit more uh, attribution incrementality. Uh, things like that. Um, you know, you'd mentioned multi-touch attribution. So I uh, want to talk about that a little bit. Um, it, ben, you want to, uh, if you want to speak a little bit though, to the advantages. So Carl was mentioning, so there's a lot of different ways to do it, but but the reason, um, Carl, you know, you mentioned it is, is moving into connected television. It used to be about uh, video completion rates was a, was a benchmark. And it, when you first started buying it, now it seems like, you know, you understand that there's more transparency to looking at those those lower funnel KPIs. So uh, Ben, if you wanna talk a little bit about why it's important and, and, and why direct to consumer brands uh, want and should should be in the space. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes to what Carr said. Um, if, if you're gonna use um, paid social as your only expansion channel, um, you face a saturation problem, right? So if you're going to uh, Google meal kits, right? Or, or your browser history indicates that um, you have an interest in meal kits or you've um, at one point, clicked out of an Instagram ad for a meal kit, all of a sudden, your entire feed is Blue Apron, flesh, uh, Freshly, uh, you know, you name it, it's going to be every single meal kit one after another as you scroll down that page. Um, so the question for a brand like Blue Apron or the question for a growth marketer like Car at that point becomes, how do I stand out when my feed is just one thing after another that's offering a relatively comparable product? Um, and within a single channel, that can be a really difficult question to answer. Um, the benefit of CTV, which Carl also alluded to, is that that level of saturation does not exist, nor does that level of inherent kind of intent marketing. Um, it's much more, um, you know, historically, it's been more upper funnel. It's only been called upper funnel because there hasn't been measurement in place to kind of track the bottom funnel impact. Um, but from a targeting standpoint, you're much less likely to be inundated by the same thing over and over again as a consumer. Um, it also presents an environment that... Um, really represents a, a, a kind of consumer response, right? So um, we have a couple uh, statistics up here on the uh, on the slide for you. Um, but essentially, uh, consumers are very, very likely to take whatever action the brand requires um, or some action that is valuable to a brand after exposure on this channel, um, much more so than linear. Um, you know, it's kind of more of, a, I think, Brittany on our marketing team likes to call it a lean-in environment, right? A lot of times, um, when you're watching connected TV, you're calling content up on demand, you're paying close attention. It's not just fading into the background, um, you know, kind of like linear TV does. Uh, it's kind of white noise. Great. Thanks. Hey, can you take us a little bit through, Ben, if you don't mind, the, the consumer journey um, of, of connected television? And then, and then a little bit about what clients and, and customers and, and marketers should be asking of their OTT providers. Yeah, I think even before we jump into that, let's, you know, we'll, we'll take you through a consumer journey here. Um, but you all can see there's uh, a lot of touch points generally um, that take place prior to a consumer taking whatever brand uh, action the brand uh, ultimately desires, whether it's purchase, a subscription, um, a lead, whatever it might be. So, Car, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put the ball in your court here. Um, what's a typical consumer journey look like for you guys over at Blue Apron? What are the channels you guys are running on? You're on mute, Kurt. At, at Blue Apron, we pretty much are in any channel you can think of, traditional and uh, and and digital. Um, so you know, we we really span the span the gamut. Uh, like everything else, the the real challenge is figuring out what is what is moving the needle for us. Um, and attribution that that you know we'll get into is 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 always a challenge. So. Uh, like in this particular journey, you can see there's four or five 
uh, touch points uh, for us on average, uh, it can range anywhere from as for someone who has never tried a meal kit before, you're, you're looking at anywhere between four to six uh, touch points at the minimum. Uh, and sometimes it can even be 15 before you really convince someone who's used to go going to grab groceries to, uh, you know, switch over to to a um, to a meal kit. Uh, one thing that has has worked in our advantage is, in, you know, unfortunately, COVID, where people are used to now getting, you know, their food delivered or the groceries delivered. So that, you know, kind of that barrier has been um, brought down a bit, but it still requires uh, touching folks across multiple points. Uh, it, it's the the new battle amongst brands is really just, uh, you know, the your fight for the a certain type of a certain amount of impressions on your mind and staying on top of top of mind. So like you mentioned, Ben, uh, if, if somebody went to perhaps one of my competitors, uh, website, I, you know, perhaps try to conquest them with a display ad or, you know, or my, through my paid social, but you know, it, it just, it just kind of becomes pretty bloody. So it's really about figuring out what is bringing, um, you know, figuring, making sure that, what I what I classify as as channels that bring new audiences, making sure they drive that first touch point at least drives them to the website so we can pixel them and you know or or tag them and then kind of work the funnel with different kinds of messaging across various platforms. So that's kind of how we we tackle the problem at, at Blue Apron. Yeah. And it's also important to note that within any one of these channels, so you know you've got TV, OTT, podcast, search, social media. Within any one of these channels, there's going to be multiple touch points. And those touch points are going to be interspersed with the touch points from other channels. So if you look at something like OTT, that one little uh, kind of icon there is really representative of, um, you know, an impression from Creative A, an impression from Creative B, an impression from a 15-second creative, an impression from a 30-second creative, an impression on Hulu, an impression on Sling. Um, you know, these things are you know, like Car said, it gets messy very, very quickly. Um, and brands really face two questions as a result. Number one is how do I measure this, um, you know, within the channel uh, exclusively? And then how do I measure this across channels? Um, because if you can't measure within the channel, then you can't move your media in a way that makes you um, kind of nimble enough to improve your return on ad spend or lower your CPA as your campaign goes along. And if you can't measure across channels, then you're duplicating efforts. So these are the kinds of questions that growth marketers are facing. So this is kind of like, um, you know, the holy grail of marketing is you know, having the answers to both these questions. Um, and here at Digital Remedy, we've, you know, taken steps to at least start addressing them. Uh, you know, we're far from perfect. I think nobody in this space is perfect at this point. Um, but, you know, we're, we're on a road that's going to allow us to at least um, start addressing how we're going to distribute credit. Um, you know, multi-touch attribution has been thrown around a lot already um, and we'll talk about it more um, but we're figuring out how we're going to distribute credit among channels and within channels um, brings us to this slide which is the you know the evolution of attribution and with ott specifically um i think marketers faced a bit of a challenge in the past um, similar to my how it might work on television um, these ads are not clickable right so this is kind of like the biggest nuance of this space is that you're getting served an ad that is for all intents and purposes a commercial um, the action that, you know, uh, Blue Apron is going to want to take place is not going to happen on that same device. Um, so essentially you get served an ad, um, you know, you're watching Hulu. Let's go back to that Handmaid's Tale example. We've got to show that most people in the audience here probably know. Um, and they see that Blue Apron ad, um, and then ultimately they're going to go on their mobile phone or they're going to go on their laptop and, you know, become a Blue Apron subscriber or have a free trial. Um, or just join a mailing list. Um, that's the kind of real world situation that we're trying to address right now. And because the conversion doesn't happen on the same device, marketers um, have you know, faced a, a pretty significant challenge in the past in terms of connecting the dots. Um, what we've developed here at Digital Remedy is a solution called Flip, um, which does exactly that. It connects the dots between impressions on connected TVs and real world actions that matter to brands. Um, like Blue Apron, um, and those actions can be subscriptions, location visits, um, you know, sales, really whatever a brand is is looking for in the real world. That's exactly what we're trying to address. Um, Car, do you want to just you know talk about how you've leveraged us in some of your past companies? 
Right. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges, you know, you get off the bat is, you know, especially if we talk about examples of like, you know, companies maybe in the earlier stage, series A, series B, where, you know, every marketing dollar has to be accounted for in some form of like direct response versus like, you know, some, somewhere bigger at, at Blue Apron, where we do have certain amounts of capital uh, allocated for brand awareness and higher level metrics, right? So I think one of the one of the um, you know best solves that CTV does is is and especially with a platform such as such as Flip, um, you know it it was able to connect um, um, the the order ID to to the to the view, which is which which sounds so simple, but uh, it, it, it's massive on, on so many levels, just because sure, that was not the only touch point, but I know exactly what time that was, that, that, that occurrence happened that when, when the, um, when the impression was exposed and then when, how long it took someone to get to the site and then using, you know, other UTM parameters across other channels, I'm able to stitch some, you know, even even in a smaller company without a fancy attribution model, I'm able to stitch the data together in a, in a linear form and starting to get an idea of like, oh, like um, OTT truly was like the first touch point when they that's what drove them to the site. The first in the in the in in the first place about eighty percent of the time, and I'm able able to allocate a certain dollar amount to that, uh, and and you know, portion of my CAC for that channel, I'm able to kind of back into it it's just it's rough basic math but like you're able to because of the fact that you're able to tie the view to a conversion um you know you are able to you know make that justification um uh to you know upper management that hey this is a worthwhile channel um and then as as you know sometimes you know as, as i've used you guys in the more sophisticated uh you know uh sophisticated like programs that i've run where i do have a multi-touch attribution i can download all this data from flip and put that into my mta model which has been you know uh which has been huge and then really get into the science there of media mix modeling and 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 and, and figuring out what the true cac and true value of of uh, CTV has been, but for me personally, CTV in general has been a great source of new audiences that I was not able to touch uh, in the, your traditional paid social channels. So, yeah, I think I think Carr hit on something important there, which is um, the the match, so to speak, the conversion. However, you match it, whether it's through some version of. Um, IP matching or device graphing where, you know, an impression happens on one device and a conversion happens on another. That's the kind of match we're talking about. That's really only the first step in the process, right? So if we can record the conversion, um, that's step one. Um, step two is really figuring out um, what were all of the touch points along that consumer journey, whether within this channel alone or within this channel and outside of this channel. And then how do we distribute credit along those touch points? Um, and that is, you know, kind of the growth marketer's job. The growth marketer's um, key initiative is, is the distributing of that credit and the allocating of resources um, according to that distribution. Right. And, and one more thing to add here is uh, the ability to connect it to the order ID, which you can connect to your customer. And now you actually have you're able to track the customer LTV. Uh, even if you don't use that as your acquisition metric, that's kind of a, a soft metric you can keep on the side and just see like, hey, OTT was my first touch point. This is what the channel, this is the type of customer the channel brings in to see if it, if it makes sense. And as we all know, the subscription LTV is pretty much, I would say, equal or more important than, than your acquisition costs. So um, yeah, so that's another advantage uh, of CTV in general. So. Thanks, Carl. Can you share a little bit? What are some questions with with the folks on the phone today, uh, marketers that they should be asking any partner within the OTT space? I think one is how much. It's just the transparency. Uh, I think at this point, uh, if any you know uh, potential CTV partner that I'm looking at uh, or working with, if I ask like. Hey, how do you guys? Uh, what what are your key KPIs? And if the answer is not conversion, I tend to turn end the conversation and run 
run away. Uh, if anyone comes to me with like, oh, video com completion is kind of your old school metrics. I'm like, you're probably not like, you know, uh, by by no means is digital revenue the only only um, the provider out there that can stitch this data. But like, it, I think that's a that's a really quick one. If someone can, has no no plan on how to tie your conversions and kind of prove CTV out as a conversion channel, you're probably talking to the wrong uh, <laughs> to the wrong provider. Uh, and then uh, full transparency of like where your um, where your dollars are going across. As we saw, you you can buy through an MVPD or through a Sling. Uh, you can you you know go through various providers like Hulu, so on and so forth. And now with HBO Max and and all the other, there's so many new streaming platforms uh, coming on board. So that transparency of like what is working where um, is is useful because sometimes sometimes it if you see there's a particular channel that is working within a CTV that's working well, it might make sense to make a direct buy. I'm not saying that um, that's the way you should go all the time. Uh, personally, I prefer buying using a um, using an agency such like Digital Remedy just because you can control the frequency by customer. If you make direct buys, you might be hitting the same customer on Hulu, on HBO Max, you know, and sometimes that becomes too much. I, I know we're all fighting for like mindshare, but if you hit someone 35 times in, in a week, they're probably going to get turned off versus you can keep that control when you buy a bit more holistically and and and, and go across multiple channels and kind of let the algorithm do its thing. Um, so yeah, that's that's my take on it. So. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, all, all great points and, and you hit, hit upon uh, a big one, you know, transparency. We'll get into some privacy discussions in a bit. Um, but, you know, what we, uh, you know, what we love to hear is that, you know, if you, you're asking your marketer, you know, what is the transparency and, and what are you delivering as far as those, those, lower, funnel, those lower funnel KPIs? Uh, that should be of the utmost importance to, to any, uh, any growth marketer. So thank you for that. Very consistent from what we're hearing. Um, so, you know, as we discussed, because, you know, yeah, you don't want to hit them 35 times, um, you have to have that attribution uh, measurement holistically and looking at it from, yes, we can reach the right person at the right time. It's addressable. So connected TV is reaching a specific audience. Um, and as we talked about, the, the downside of, of not being clickable, uh, but it's not skippable either, uh, which means that they're watching the, the entire commercial. And, and again, we're going to get into creative and, and want to hear Carr's thoughts on that. Um, but again, it's beyond that measure of video completion rate. That should not be, uh, hopefully, uh, in the next couple of years, that will be going away uh, as, as, a, as a benchmark. Of course, a video completion rate. I mean, somebody actually watched your commercial. That's, that, that's, that's not table stakes anymore. That, that should be a thing of the past. Uh, you know, we should, we should be talking about uh, those lower funnel those lower funnel KPIs. So I'm, you know, we, we mentioned it a, a briefly. Our, our OTT CTV platform is called Flip. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Ben is an integral part of, of developing this platform. So I wanted to have him talk a little bit about what we're doing. And, and this is the, the platform, again, that Carr had mentioned he utilizes for, uh, for his brands. And so uh, Ben, if you could take us through exactly what Flip is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what we've developed here is a CTV. Well, it's called an OTT platform. Let me get my, my language straight. An OTT platform for performance, um, for those lower funnel conversions that we've been talking about this whole time. Um, with regards to the people in the audience, it's an OTT stack for subscriptions. Um, you know, that would be probably your, your main KPI, or maybe it becomes um, an OTT stack for LTV. Um, and we can talk about how, how we would kind of ingest that information. But um, the first thing about Flip is um, kind of let's discuss where your ads will be served. Um, the landscape is vast um, in terms of where these ads can show up. Um, and the way to access that inventory is uh, can be at times confusing. Um, the important thing to note about the way that we buy is that our uh, inventory comes directly from each of the publishers. So whether it's from uh, you know, a network group like a Discovery, um, or it's from uh, an app that you might see on your, your home screen when you turn on your Roku television, um, like a Sling um, or like a Pluto, uh, you know, our relationships are directly with those channels. Um, as a brand, 
who is looking to dip your toes into this channel, I would offer you a word of caution. Um, if you are working with a provider who kind of lumps uh, anything under like the other publishers category at the bottom of your report, uh, that's something to watch out for because this space is honestly um, rife, with rife with fraud. Um, and, you know, as, as this channel has grown, so has those um, kind of IVT rates and the, the primary um, kind of suspect for those uh, high IVT rates are exchange-based inventory. It's inventory that um, happens on what we call long tail sources. Um, you know, there's uh, a lot of apps out there. Um, and then within those apps, there's a lot of channels. And, um, you know, I think we here have a philosophy that we want to keep it to household names. We want to keep it to home screen apps only. Um, we want to keep it to network groups that you know. Um, and honestly, we've seen performance, um, you know, net out to um, back or validate uh, that suspicion. Um, and, you know, if if you're running long tail, it may be a little bit cheaper. Um, but the impressions are ultimately more valuable on sources that you've that you've heard of. Um, you know, the second part of this is targeting. So just because you're, you know, targeting or you're, you're running on sling doesn't mean you're reaching the right people or the right channels that you would like to um, uh, ultimately run on or, or you think are suitable for your brand. So, you know, we have access here to over, you know, 10,000 audience segments um, from a third party standpoint. So if you're looking for somebody who is in market for meal kit, um, we absolutely have a segment for that. We probably have over a dozen segments for that. Um, if you are looking to use your first party data and you have a customer list um, and you would like to suppress them so that you don't waste impressions to current customers because this is a prospecting campaign, we can take your data, safely ingest it, um, and convert it into a format that can be suppressed so that we're not wasting those impressions. If you want to launch um, you know, a new initiative to current customers, and that's the goal of your campaign, we can retarget that list. Um, if you want to find valuable prospects who look like your current customers, we can take your list and um, create a lookalike audience off of it. So there's, there's a whole host of things that you can do with data in this space um, and that we can do with Flip. Um, and it, it alludes to the point that, that TJ hit on um, in the last slide, which is that this channel is inherently addressable, right? So if you're if you're running on linear television um, and you're you're looking for a comparison between OTT versus linear, well, uh, on linear you're you're going to index highly against something, um, which just means that there's a high probability of um, people in your audience being a part of you know this buy. Um, with OTT, all of that filtering happens pre-bid. So you actually, you don't have to worry about indexing. You're just not gonna serve impressions to households that fall outside of your key demo. Um, so that's a, a huge, huge benefit of this channel. Um, number two is full funnel attribution. So, you know, we've touched on this, but, um, you know, you have to be able to make a match between the impression that happens on the connected television or wherever you're streaming. Um, and ultimately wherever that conversion happens, whether it's the same device or much more likely a different device. Um, so Flip certainly offers that. We offer you four um, MTAs. Um, so you can choose between first touch, last touch, linear, or time decay, whatever suits your brand. Um, you can toggle at will and redistribute credit however you see fit. Um, and then lastly, what use is all of this data that we're collecting for you if we don't actually put it to work? So if we see Sling is performing better than Hulu or we see Creative B is performing better than Creative A, um, it would be really foolish of us to leave money in Creative A or leave money in Hulu um, as opposed to move money toward things that are better working. Um, and that is exactly what we've built here, um, which is a way for us to, in real time, assess what is working with your campaign, um, kind of like a real time A-B testing environment, you can call it. Um, and then once we know what's working, we're going to move money according to, uh, you know, how well it's working, how much better it's working than the other source or the other variable within the campaign. Um, and the results honestly speak for themselves. That's why Carr has worked with us. I know he, um, you know, enjoys our company, but he wouldn't enjoy it uh, enough to keep working with us if the returns didn't kind of back up um, everything that we've kind of said throughout this presentation. So, um, you know, we're, we're very proud of what we've built here. Um, and customers like Carr allow us to um, get feedback and iterate um, according to, you know, what's actually going to help their brands and the data they would actually like to see. Yeah. That, thanks, Ben. That, you, you touched upon something, and I'd love to get Carr's take. Um, you know, we, we talk about our optimization and the attribution and the channels we're buying and, and how we're doing it. But one of the vital pieces, and I'm sure a lot of the folks on the call want to hear from you, Carr, um, is your take on the creative. You know, Ben mentioned 
A-B testing, but can you talk a little bit about best practices, what you've seen work, what you've seen not work when it, when it pertains to the actual creatives you're using? Sure. Um, so, I mean, there are, there's a huge gamut of, of different types of creative. Uh, and I really just kind of, uh, the way I decide what to run is, is kind of like one end of the spectrum is full brand and one end of the spectrum is full performance. Um, you know, the, what I consider full brand is like someone dancing on the moon and then turns out it's like a Chanel 5 perfume ad. Um, uh, you know, that's what I consider full brand, uh, and performance is almost as close to a 15 second infomercial um, that as, as you can create. And I really found the sweet spot really kind of works uh, in the middle here. Uh, I think one thing is you have to, uh, you know, I think folks' attention spans are definitely, you know, uh, with the rise of social media, uh, people use ads as a, uh, t you know, see TV ads as a time to perhaps look down on their phones and check, check their messages. So you have to treat your ads kind of in the same way of that zero to three second impact of like, you have to have a hook really quick, even though you have 15 or 30 seconds to tell your story, it has to stop um, you have to stop people from looking down on their phones. So I think that is a, a huge thing that I think some people miss uh, when they are, you know, designing for a, a, t a TV ad in general, uh, whether it's linear or uh, OTT, you have to put yourself um, in, in the perspective of the person on the couch. Uh, and, and you got to think, um, I immediately start checking my slacks or, or, or start, you know, checking my Instagram messages. If, if, you know, what I see in front of me in the next, in one or one or two seconds does not, you know, capture my attention. You sometimes have to, and I think you have to also at op least optimize for no sound, uh, cause some people just mute it, uh, until the ticker runs off. Um, so I think just simple best practice that people sometimes forget is, like your website name in the top left or top right um, and that, you know, at least visually people, <clears throat> you know, you're making that impression of, you know, blueapron.com or, or uh, whatever your brand is. And yeah. And I'm, uh, you know, generally to test, um, I think sometimes people uh, or, or brand teams um, don't test uh, different enough concepts um, when they, when they first uh, do an AB test, um, so use the way um, I like to approach it with brand teams is really like pick your two top reasons, reasons to believe uh, on your product and then really develop two concepts that are, that look fair, look fairly different from each other. Um, there are sometimes you can, you know, use the same shoot, but you can completely chop it up differently and, and get your messaging across differently. And that's how you start testing. Not by, I would, if you're, if you're early in the game, I would not just test two different end cards because I, that I don't really, in my experience, that really doesn't really tell you <laughs> whether it's a $15 or $20 offer that moves, that moves the needle. Um, it seems to be irrelevant. And on the performance side, something that's kind of been making a, making a hot comeback uh, since COVID is, is QR codes right on the, right on the ad. Um, and that, I think that's, that's kind of interesting foray that uh that has made a comeback you know I, personally i thought your codes were dead in the water but it's, it kind of rage back and yeah and people are trying that out where you can just uh take your phone and shoot the screen and um and, and get to a, a customized landing page uh for a coherent experience so yeah so i think these are some of the interesting things that are happening in creative um i don't think there's a magic bullet but really figuring out when you test really figuring out two distinct um uh, things that you want to test against each other. Uh, I think a, the one of the big, as a, to reiterate, one of the biggest mistakes is people not differentiating enough between their creative. So, yeah. Awesome. And then, you know, you mentioned a little bit um, about end cards, things like that, but what about length? Uh, uh, length? Um, I think for, especially in the CTV world, I think you're going to get uh, your best exposure on 15 and 30 seconds. So I would design a 30 second concept and um, and figure out, work with a great editor to get it down to 15. So I think those 15 and 30 still seem to be the standard and um, that I've seen uh, till, uh, till, this, till this time, so yeah. Awesome, thank you, thank you for that. You know, um, we, uh, you, you know, we wanted to just, we'll briefly show you know, all, all of the, all of these 
tactics are, are found in the in the flip dashboard all of the tactics that you're utilizing within uh, uh, connected television and and again back to the back to the questions you should be asking of your ott providers and partners um you know how am i getting that return on ad spend and how am i seeing that transparently and, and so of course we'll we'll show that uh for folks in, in a dashboard and we'll show that to our to our customers um but wanted to jump into the more the most important things uh for for marketers and so um you know want to talk about optimizing your campaign towards the things that matter to you uh, as a marketer. So, um, you know, Carr, if, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how you used uh, Flip in the past and what were those lower funnel uh, KPIs that you were not only tracking, but then we were optimizing for you that were, were most vital and that's how you're looking at it going, going forward. Um, I think the, the KPIs that I was really looking at um, started at like cost per site visit, um, which is basically, how many new uh, or what kind of uh, th how much it cost me to just get folks to, this, to, to the site. And then, of course, then looking at the cost per acquisition and then just working my way down eventually when I had enough data to to kind of like the, my initial three month customer lifetime value and so on and so forth. So uh, but it really starts with um, the site visits that um, um and me just being digital focused, I'm sure there's other stuff like uh, store footprints and stuff that you can measure. But uh, for me, it's always been, it starts with the site visit and, and whether that dollar value makes sense. Um, so I always look at it in two ways. One is like, is my creative bringing the right, uh, is bringing enough people to the site for how much I'm spending? And then am I bringing the right people to the site? So really for something like CTV, I start with, can, is this even driving people to site? And then of course, just figure out the quality of the customer after that. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. I, you know, for, um, I guess for the folks on the phone, we wanted to open it up. Uh, Lauren, if you, if you want to uh, throw some questions from the group, that would be, uh, that'd be great. So uh, first, and, and first, uh, thanks to, thanks to Carla. That was really helpful um, in, in not only your feedback, but your insight on it, uh, I think is, is helpful for all of us. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, Car, thank you so much. Wonderful insights. And thank you, Ben and TJ. Um, if you have any questions at all, like we said earlier, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section of the chat. Um, I've got a couple here right now for you. Um, with all the recent and upcoming consumer privacy changes, how is OTT and CTV advertising affected? Cool. Um, I can take that one. Um, I think one of my favorite things about CTV is the fact that, you know, most uh, what I consider good uh, partners can get you down to the order level and using an order ID uh, or like a hash customer ID. Uh, most of the time, if you can get down to the order ID, then you don't really have the privacy concerns because you know it's just an arbitrary number versus uh, using an email or even a last four of your credit card to, to do various kinds of matchbacks. So uh, I think it's one of my favorite things about CTV is the fact that you're just, you can get this hash number and then you can connect, you take that connected to your first party own data uh, within your environment. And it, I think it's definitely a bit more safe uh, than, you know, uh, other channels out there where you sometimes have to go back and forth with emails and, and things of that nature. Um, sure. Thank you so much. From from the marketing side as well, I think it's just important to note that this channel is entirely cookie-less, right? So there's been much ado made about uh, the death of the cookie. Um, and honestly, a lot of that has been overblown. It's a third-party cookie, not a first-party cookie. So there's certainly some workarounds there. Um, but it is important to note that um, that kind of death, uh, so to speak, has very, very little impact on this channel unless you're ultimately trying to match back to uh, an app install. Um, and there's some challenges around that, but in terms of general subscription site visits, um, any of that kind of stuff, any digital actions, um, all of those things are still trackable despite, you know, this, uh, you know, growing concern within the marketing community. Awesome. Thanks guys. A um, couple of questions here in the chat. Um, someone wondering, can you go into targeting beyond demo and geo? Um, so for instance, purchase intents for OTT. Yeah, um, you, you definitely can. I mean, you, you can go into as deep as you want. And I think what I would, I would caution is not getting so, um, so down the line of putting targeting upon targeting upon targeting. 
uh, it's trying out a few different audiences. It's fun. It's and it's all possible. So that's the short answer. That yes, you can target purchase intent. You can target people most likely to sign up for a subscription box. You can target people about a specific subscription box. Um, so, but the thing is you want to keep it a little more broad and see what's actually out there and what's working. Of course, you want to be targeted with your demographic and even with some audiences, um, audience targeting, not just within the content, but actually uh, audience targeting by that person's profile. Uh, as we mentioned before, it's addressable. Um, so we, it, it's all possible. It's just, should you, or shouldn't you do it? And I think it's on a, it's on a campaign by campaign basis. Awesome. Thank you, TJ. Um, we've got a question chatted in here from Abba. Uh, what lesser known streaming platforms do you work with? Ben, you want to jump uh, in? Yeah, I, mean, I guess you'd have to define lesser known. We are uh, quite close to this space, um, maybe me specifically, given that um, but, you know, I've kind of gone out and uh, assembled our marketplace. Um, but, you know, we work with some smaller streamers. So, you know, um, two good examples of that might be uh, Fubo and Philo. Um, you can see them, you know, if you do turn on your, your Roku TV or your Fire TV, those are kind of home screen apps and they're both VMBPDs or digital cable bundles. Um, but their subscriber bases are much smaller than like a sling or even an at and tv now or a, a youtube tv live um you know there's uh a myriad of, of different sources out there um that uh, kind of run the spectrum in terms of let's call it quality um, but also in terms of function um so on the avod side we stick to things like crackle um tubi um uh obviously hulu is a huge one um, but we, we like to keep it to household names. Um, and the reason we like to keep it to household names is because number one, that's where there's scale, right? Like if you haven't heard of it, there's probably not a whole lot of people watching it. Um, and even if it's going to be great for your brand, my ability to ramp up on that platform is going to be limited. Um, the second reason is just performance. I mean, we've tested anything and everything that has been out there, um, and all sorts of buying methods, um, exchange based, direct or otherwise. Um, and what we found is that direct, well-known platforms um, provide the best lower funnel performance, ultimately. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, one more question from our chat here. Could you go into any specifics about how attribution should be viewed by a brick and mortar location rather than maybe a D to C business? Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, can, I can take that. Um, yeah, it's a different. Uh, so the question is, where does the conversion data come from? Right. So what we've built is not rocket science, quite frankly. We are um, always kind of connecting the dots between two streams of data. We have impression data and we have conversion data um, in most instances. So, you know, subscription um, you know, this is subject. So let's talk subscriptions, digital subscriptions, specifically that information, the conversion information for subscriptions comes from our website, which ultimately comes from you, the subscription company. Um, so we have a pixel that gets placed on, you know, whoever the subscription client is, um, it gets placed on their own own property, um, wherever they're ultimately selling those subscriptions and that data passes back to us so that we can connect the dots from that conversion stream to our impression stream for brick and mortar. That pixel doesn't really do anything, right? If we want to track foot traffic, digital traffic doesn't really matter. Um, so we have a partnership with cubic, um, and in that instance, we're replacing our pixel feed with a cubic location data feed which essentially provides a similar feed of information. It's just visits and timestamp. And we're doing the exact same connecting of the dots. Um, it's just the feed comes to us through a different mechanism. Um, the only caution I would put out there when, when you do uh, foot traffic attribution is if you're selling your product within a big box retailer or a supermarket, because you're going to get some false positives. In other words, if somebody's going into a Kroger or Walmart to purchase the product, they're also there for a dozen hundreds of other things. So you don't necessarily want to directly tie that always uh, to a, uh, to attribution when you're, when you're selling with a, a location that has many other products. So it's just something to be cautious of. If it's your own location, obviously it works really well. Awesome. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, last question from our chat, and then we will go ahead and wrap up for today. Um, Leslie asks, can you talk to us about what it takes to get onto YouTube TV? Um, it's very popular right now in our market. And do you see DR being able to access this inventory in the near future? 
Uh, you're welcome to go to Google and ask on our behalf. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, YouTube TV is sold exclusively through Google reps and um, Google is a walled garden in every sense of the word. Um, so this type of attribution is not really available on that platform right now, as much as you, me, everybody here would probably love to have it. Um, it is, you know, amazing because Google has the biggest VMVPD out there. It's bigger than Sling. It's bigger than uh, Hulu with live TV. It's bigger than Philo and Fubo, obviously. Um, but unfortunately, um, it requires uh, data sharing. And that data sharing is not currently available through us or anyone right now. Got it. Thank you, Ben. Awesome. Um, one more question here um, was just asking how best to um, get into OTT advertising. So just for the entire community, you will be getting a follow-up email from the SEPTA team with the deck um, that's used today. And then if you have any follow-up questions for Digital Remedy, um, feel free to reach out. It's flip, F-L-I-P, at digitalremedy.com. Um, so any questions that you have after taking a peek at that deck, uh, feel free to send that way. And then if you have any questions for the SUBTA team, we are let's talk at subta.com. Um, so feel free to send us any questions that you have as well. Um, but again, Ben, TJ, and Carr, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day. Um, awesome insights today. A couple announcements and just housekeeping items on the SUBTA side of things. Um, Subsummit is already in the books. So if you have not yet registered for tickets, we are going to be in Orlando um, at the Walt Disney World Swan and Dolphin Resort. And that's June 1st through the 3rd of this year. Um, so if you haven't gotten your tickets again, that's subsummit.com forward slash get slash tickets. We'll go ahead and link that in our chat as well. Um, and then also wanted to remind you that we have the opportunity to get a free ticket to SubSummit this year uh, via our hosted buyer program. If you're not familiar with our hosted buyer program, this is an amazing networking opportunity, um, giving merchants and suppliers direct one-on-one -on -one time to engage in conversations about your business. Um, if you're selected, you'll be eligible to receive $500 reimbursement for travel, um, for hotel and flight expenses, as well as a free in-person ticket. Um, so we'll drop the application for that as well in the chat. Take a peek and see if you qualify. Uh, we would love to have you in Orlando with us. Um, again, if you have any other questions for us, feel free to reach out to flip at digitalremedy.com or let's talk at subta.com. Um, gentlemen, again, it, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and from the SUBTA team as well, thank you so much for taking some time out of your uh, lunch or your early morning to join us. And we will see you next time. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching this SUBTA Studios presentation. Please continue to check out our premium content right here on this website. Is there a topic you'd like to see us cover? Please feel free to contact us on social or email us at letstalkatsubta.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being part of our community.